There are a lot of similar protests, like the ones against um, Hot and Krusty. Mm -hmm. So what drew you to this struggle in particular? Well, really, it was very serendipitous. I met um, Mauma Lopez, the main character, mm -hmm. and Virgilio Baran, one of the, the main <coughs> organizers, um, through connections with the Occupy Wall Street movement mm -hmm. back in 2012. And my uh, husband, Robin, and I had been documenting the movement in the fall, um, previously in 2011. And so when we met, these folks, it really gave us, they were already reaching out to Occupy for potentially for help making plans to occupy their store. Mm -hmm. So this is a group of undocumented immigrants making plans for just civil disobedience. They had just launched their campaign at that point and they were talking to the press openly about their status, which was very courageous. And it, as filmmakers, you know, I have made um, uh, a verite film in the past and so you know looking for someone who's going to be embarking on a journey uh -huh. is something you know that's sort of part of like a working class hero well <laughs> yeah that's what it ended up being but I wasn't yeah. necessarily oh, okay. looking for that. it was more <laughs> just like you know I think the initial interest more had to do with the the theme of economic inequality and then this story was going to show um, a particular personal transformation, you know, personal journey that would touch on these these critical issues like immigration and labor issues. And um, I think that, uh, so we didn't set out to make a documentary about the topic and then do a whole bunch of research and mm -hmm. find this campaign. It was really more just a matter of meeting these people at a particular moment where they were getting ready to go through this interesting process and kind of having that you know it when you see it moment. Yeah. That kind of spark. Yeah. Yeah. And it, the whole story ended up being more dramatic than we ever imagined yeah. possible and more quick as well. Yeah. Uh, it was, what was it, like 50-something days? Well, the picket was 52 days, but yeah. the entire yeah, process then. of their campaign was a little over a year. And Which so is pretty good for the results it's, that they got. It's incredibly good, <laughs> yeah. So, like you said, the film isn't just about the need for unions and labor reform, but also touches about the abuse of immigrant labor. So after filming this or while filming this, do you think the two issues are connected? Absolutely. I really don't think that you can talk about immigration in this country without talking about labor. And I don't think you can talk about labor without talking about immigration. Yeah. Um, people come here for the most part to work and um, and immigrant workers regardless of their status are a really indispensable part of our economy mm -hmm. and I think that um, their you know the struggle for civil rights in the workplace because labor rights are civil rights um, is really part of the democratic project yeah. of the United States and so um, I, I think that you know, immigration reform is necessary on its own terms mm -hmm. to to help unite families and stop breaking up families and, and all of this. But um, but it's also going to really help improve working conditions for all American workers because the the more um, Undocumented workers are especially vulnerable to exploitation because, oh, exactly. yeah, because they, don't, they, uh, they fear they the law, they don't yeah. know their rights necessarily, and bosses think they can get away with treating them especially badly. So, mm -hmm. um, so improving their conditions improves, them for improves everyone. everyone's conditions, and you know, eliminating the threat of retaliation. So immigration reform would help labor law, would, would help enforce existing labor laws because people would be more willing to come forward mm -hmm. because they'd be less afraid of the possibility of deportation. So it's all connected in so many ways, both legally and in the experience of everyday people. So after the struggle and uh, after they were also brave to to speak out against it, even though you know their status, mm -hmm. you know their immigration status. Yeah. Were there any consequences for any of them, like as far as the law did? Not in terms of, of immigration. Yeah. So, um, first of all, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one is that they were lucky. Mm -hmm. um, 
Another is that they they did not get arrested in the course of the campaign. There was a lot of um, very, even though some people did get arrested on purpose as part of the, the demonstration, civil, the demonstration mm -hmm. there was a very specific plan to make sure that, to protect the workers from that risk. Mm -hmm. So um, so they themselves didn't take that risk and others who had status were able to do that for them. Um, there's also, I, I think also the, the climate in New York City um, helped that because, I mean, the restaurant industry in New York City, in as like many major cities, yeah, is, <laughs> is <very> just, <laughs> you know, what would it do without undocumented immigrants? There's, there's definitely um, kind of a, a tacit understanding, I think, among the public as well as restaurant owners that this is just... It's an essential it's, part of the yeah, industry. Yeah, so I don't think... The management threatened to call immigration when the workers complained, but I don't believe Just that they ever threat. did. Yeah. Well, also because it doesn't, it's not in their own interest to draw attention to it because it's actually, it, while it's technically a crime to hire undocumented workers, it's not a crime to be in the country. It's, it's a status issue. You, you know, you have to resolve, you can, you have to resolve yeah. but but it, you don't get. Um, you actually don't get assigned a, a lawyer, like in a criminal case. So it's it's not... It's like a tribunal or something? Well, it, it, actually, I mean, they just deport you directly. And, oh. and the only... You'll be um, detained if you want to contest it. So that's why there's so many people in mm -hmm. just detention for years on end, but, um, which is a whole separate issue. But in any case... It wasn't in the owner's interest to actually to call attention. Yeah, to, that. to go through especially on that on threat. Themselves. Yeah, since I don't here in Chicago, I'm not mm -hmm. very familiar with Hot and Krusty, so they are big. Uh, it's big a chain. It's in New a York. it's a small local chain, but it's actually um, so it's it's not a mom and pop at all, but it's also not as big as you know a McDonald's or any kind of mm -hmm. mega. Business. It's kind of a staple in the community. Yeah, I mean, people yeah. people know about it. There's probably 10 or 12 around the city. And each one's actually incorporated separately. They have overlapping groups of owners. Mm -hmm. So the um, so what happened in this story only applied at that one cafe. Uh, so okay. it did not... Because they're all different franchises. So. They're different franchises, but there isn't actually a parent company Oh. Like there is with McDonald's, it's a yeah. kind of a weird company structure that we didn't have time to go into. In yeah. Film. So it's. So the union is for that specific location. It's for that location. specific location. Okay. Exactly. So do you still cop keep in contact with the union? Absolutely, I'm in touch with them all the time. I have to call Mama today about a, a so. screening he's coming to on Thursday. <laughs> oh <in> Jersey. really? <laughs> yeah. So they, um, Mama, and some of the other workers come to a lot of our screenings when they're in the New York area, and we've taken him to some festivals on the East Coast. It's obviously a little more complicated, farther away. Yeah. <laughs> but um, believe it or not, we've had some requests even for festivals in Canada. Like, can we bring Mama? Like, are you, did you see the movie? Yeah, yeah like, I don't think you can cross the border. <laughs> if you want to move to Toronto permanently. We're going to offer some residents, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we're in touch with them. They're, um, things are really good at, at the moment at the store. Pretty much everyone you see in the film is still employed there. They've got the same contract, the same union in place, the same uh, ownership and management that you see at the end of the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did change the name. They rebranded last fall. Um, so it's now called Broad Kitchen, B-R-O. Just that location online. or Just that way. location. Oh, okay. Because it's, each one is totally separate as a business. Okay. So, um, so even the one, so they were hot and crusty up until, from the time of the reopening that's shown in the film up until like last August or September. And, and now they're called Bird Kitchen, but, um, but it's all the same workers and management. Is there any, are they looking to expand maybe to help other, other employees and other hot and crusties with, that are facing the same thing probably? Well, um, so Maoma actually is, in addition to his full-time job at the, at the restaurant, he's working pretty much full-time additionally as an organizer with the Laundry Workers Center. So he's organizing other restaurants, not specifically hot and crusty. But what, just other what happened, people that need. Yeah, other people that have, that have come you know, in contact through the picket line or through various mm -hmm. ways they've heard about it. Basically, during the course of the campaign, Workers came forward at a couple of other hot and crusties, and there was enough momentum. I believe there were a few wage and hour lawsuits mm -hmm. um, for unpaid back wages and unpaid overtime, but there wasn't sort of the critical mass 
of workers that were united together to go forward in a full organizing campaign um, like like there was at the 63rd Street mm -hmm. branch. So there was a little bit of organizing and then it didn't that didn't really get pick as far. Momentum. It didn't pick yeah. up momentum. I mean it's hard. You have to have like more than half of the restaurant workforce, you know, ready to, to take to that leave. step. Yeah. yeah. So unions are starting to kind of become an endangered species in themselves. Uh, why do you think that is? Wow, that's a, a large question, and I, I wish I could give or, all the reasons for it, but it's definitely, I mean, it's been, different people mark the decline at different times in history, mm -hmm. but I think the steepest decline has been since the 80s, yeah. uh, with so, with the you know, specific policies of the Reagan administration and the rise of right to work laws. And um, so there's, I think that there's a lot of reasons for it. And the, the main thing that I think it's important, it's important to challenge the assumption that unions are no longer relevant mm -hmm. just because most people don't work in factories anymore. I think a lot of people have this impression that unions are a thing of the past for that reason. and. It's true. Most people don't belong to unions these days, and there's all these attacks. Um, but we have to remember that it was because of the labor movement that we have the eight-hour day, that there, we don't have child labor, uh, yeah, that we have, breaks, that we have breaks, breaks at all, yeah. Yeah. Or, or even just a, a culture of, um, you know, employer responsibility for the health and safety of workers. You know, obviously there's always violations of these things, but we do have an expectation of certain basic rights mm -hmm. that we didn't used to have in this country. And I think that what you see now is the, even though it's an uphill battle, there is a lot more movement in the labor movement than, yeah. <laughs> than there was a few years ago. I think, you know, after the economic crisis and um, after Occupy Wall Street, and you've got the, uh, on the one hand, you have the fast food movement, um, which is uh, it touched funded by, upon at the end of the yeah, film. so yeah. that actually started right after this campaign ended. So we wanted to just kind of gesture towards that yeah, the expansion. Yeah. yeah, so that is happening and that um, is being promoted by the SEIU, one of the biggest unions in the country. Mm -hmm. But then you also have worker centers, which have been growing for 10 or 15 years. These small nonprofits, which are not themselves unions, um, they're called alternative labor groups, like the Laundry Worker Center. So those groups have been expanding also, um, and uh, they exist all over the place, you know, providing services and assistance to mostly low-wage, often immigrant workers. So I think those two movements that you see expanding, you know, really together represent a new phase of the labor movement that hopefully will be able to, you know, raise the uh, conditions for, for the lowest paid workers in our society. So what do you think your average person can do to help prevent the the, you know, disintegration of the unions or to help revitalize more unions? That's a really good question. I mean, I, I think everybody has a different role to play depending on where, mm -hmm. where you're at and what your situation is. I mean, obviously, if you're a member of a union, I think you can, you know, be part of trying to make sure that the union membership making sure that that union is run in a democratic fashion because not all unions are sometimes um, sometimes it's very hierarchical sometimes there isn't a lot of say for rank and file members but I think the Chicago teacher strike is a fantastic example mm -hmm. of ordinary union members becoming really involved to the point that the union was able to be much more successful than anyone ever imagined they could be mm -hmm. then of course most people are not members of unions <laughs> I think it's important to remember, you know, to, when you see someone that has a benefit that you don't have, mm -hmm. instead of saying, oh, why should they have that? They shouldn't have that if I don't have that. Mm -hmm. You could say, I could have I that. Could have that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> why doesn't everybody have that? <laughs> so, like, just sort of flipping that way of looking at it, I think, I, I really hope that the film leaves people feeling like they have a sense of agency 
not just to create their own union, which is obviously a really, you know, serious process to embark and you don't want to yeah <laughs> not it's not for everyone <laughs> it's not necessarily the solution for everything but just to um to be a part of something and to to realize that people can come together you know organizing in your workplace for better conditions and treatment and respect doesn't have to mean forming a union it can and i think that it, the more Americans were members of unions, I think our, our society would be more egalitarian. But, um, but you know, you could organize a delegation with your co-workers to, you know, ask for some kind of reform some, yeah. that you feel you need, and you don't need, that's the essence of what a union is. It's workers coming together to have a voice collectively that they wouldn't otherwise mm -hmm. have. And demand things that no one is going to give them unless they demand them, you know? So I feel like that's the essence of it. So late last year, I don't know if you heard of it, a French film came out called mm -hmm. Two Days, One Night. Oh my gosh, I still haven't seen it. I have been um, wanting to see it. Well, it was. Yeah. It basically showed how the companies often manipulate their employees yeah. into working against their unions, mm -hmm. kind of like Gonzalo did. Mm. So who's to blame more, do you think, the companies or the employees that let themselves be manipulated? I, I think it's the companies, the companies. because because the employees are are really pressed. I mean, you know, it's not. I, I don't actually know the story of two days, one night. Unfortunately, don't spoil it. I'm, I'm planning no, to see it. No, I'm not going soon. to. Yeah. I just gave you the gist. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, yeah. So I. Um, but you know, if a company offers a worker that has a family to support some kind of financial deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm not saying it's totally cool to accept that. Like, obviously, there is an ethical commitment to your coworkers. Like, but, um, but I think that it's the main blame should lie with the company, company. for for having those kind of tactics because they're, it's just another way of preying upon the need of the workers mm -hmm. and the fact that they need um, to support their families. I mean, that is, it's the, one of the oldest tactics in the book, you know, make someone a manager, give them a raise so that they won't, so that they'll stop organizing, um, and turn against the rest of the group. So, um, yeah, it's tricky. So whatever happened to Gonzalo? Well, we, so that scene that with him in the film after he leaves was filmed after the story was complete. So, um, oh, okay. so, we, he wasn't willing to come right out and say, yes, I accepted the bribe from the management. Mm -hmm. But what we believe happened was that he accepted the offer and then didn't actually get it because the store closed just a couple of months after he left the, uh, the group. Um, so the company that he was offered a stake in cease to exist yep <laughs> and when the new owners come in they create a new company even though it's going to be the same store in the same location it's new owners and technically the way the whole franchise system works with this business it's a new company so at that point gonzalo and all the other workers who were not part of the who were not um part of the initial campaign had left to find other jobs I should say, all the workers who weren't picketing had left to find other jobs. And so Gonzalo found, when we caught up with him again like a year later or so, he was working at a deli nearby, that not owned by the same management. And um, he actually had more positive things to say about the union and the whole experience than I had imagined he would. Mm -hmm. He said that he valued, you know, having learned about his rights and that he was actually more respected. Thank you in his current workplace because because he had a reputation as a labor organizer. <laughs> um, but it sounded like, um, you know, like I said, he wouldn't really tell us one way or the other what mm -hmm. happened. And so my best guess is that that's what happened, is that he accepted because of the conversations that various other people had with him at that time, it sounded like that what people you know saw him talking to owners and managers at specific mm -hmm. points and you know after he stopped attending meetings and you know it's impossible to prove yeah. necessarily um, but it looks pretty likely that that happened but then ultimately he was kind of 
left out in the cold along with the other workers. Would they have been accepted into the new union? I think, um, that's a really good question. You know, originally, so the, the store at the time that they formed the union was, was pretty divided. I guess they had like 12 votes in favor and eight against. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty small workplace um, to begin with. Uh, most of the people who were against the union were direct relatives of the manager. Yeah. And then there were a few folks um, who needed you know, the job stability. Or, or, or well, that they they thought that the stability would be better. Yeah. In, with that, so it's two different approaches to job stability, obviously. But um, in any case, so would the union have accepted any of those workers in particular? I think they would have been really suspicious. I mean, it's hard to say, but I think if yeah. someone had come back and said like, oh, I changed my mind, like I think they probably would have been suspicious that it was mm -hmm. someone from the company trying to find out about their strategic plans by sitting in on meetings, because that had happened mm -hmm. earlier in the campaign with workers who were involved for a short time and mm -hmm. then ended up on the company's side and the workers sort of had the sense that that's what was going on. Another thing which is very common yeah. in labor campaigns. So. so any upcoming projects we should keep an eye out for? Nothing that's quite ready to, <laughs> to discuss in much detail. <laughs> um, so we are, we're still working on uh, some of the distribution and audience engagement for this project mm -hmm. for the next few months at least. Um, we just had a uh, limited theatrical release in New York and LA earlier this month oh. and um, it's going to be in a few other cities. It'll be in San Diego in May and we're waiting to hear about other bookings. But um, So there's sporadic screenings going on and we're doing a lot of community work with partner organizations. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, here in Ch one of our partner organizations is based here in Chicago, Interfaith Worker Justice. So um, on our website, you can see all of our partners and various different um, ways that people can get involved. But we, we hope to do a whole bunch of community screenings for workers and, and community groups to support specific local campaigns and stuff. So that's going to take some time and some work. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, I'm very interested in, in criminal justice as a, criminal as a justice. theme. Um, I'll see where that any, goes. No, any topic in mind? It's then? it's not really. I, I just feel like it's so not even. It's too. It's, it's too new. It, it's too new, and yeah. I don't even know what the story is. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, that topic is huge, and there's been a million yeah. movies about <laughs> it. But um, so I'm not. I, I think that personally, I would love to make a film that is. The, the thing that I'd love to repeat about this film, if possible, if it may not be possible, is a personal story that really reveals kind of a broader system at work mm -hmm. and um, maybe some cracks in the system that of some suggestions of how solutions could be could be possible. I don't know. Something like that, I hope. <laughs> Were you thinking of sticking with the theme of immigration or labor or um, I don't know. I don't know. I think if, it, if something comes up, uh, I would certainly be open to that. Um, I feel like in a lot of ways it would be smart to stick with that, but at the same time... Um, I, Something else, I, could. something else could also be really interesting. I mean, um, it's been really rewarding to work on this for the past three years, which is a very short time for a doc. We, the film itself took two years to complete, which mm -hmm. is very short for a documentary. I'm sure no future project will be that short. because <laughs> their story just resolves so quickly. But, um, uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it'll be, it's, a, it's always sort of a process of yeah. discovery, and I, I hope yeah. to have that moment Again, like, like I was one. describing, which is like, this is the next project. But it uh, takes the, all the right pieces coming together <laughs> to make that happen.